Welcome to the Career Now podcast. I'm your host, Jed Lee Henry, and on today's show we have Joseph Jun. Now, Joseph is a former lawyer and currently documentary filmmaker focusing on a rarely reported Korean diaspora. That is, those Koreans who fled the peninsula in 1905, ended up in Mexico, and eventually in Cuba. Joseph's forthcoming documentary is entitled Geronimo, or as I will mispronounce at multiple stages in this podcast, Geronimo. Now, as I mentioned, in 1905, there was a strange diaspora leaving the Korean peninsula. Over a thousand Koreans boarded a boat in the port city of Incheon, and they were headed for Mexico, which they were promised was, and I quote, heaven on earth, a land of opportunity, somewhere where they could make money and return to their homeland in four or five years. And they were leaving Korea in many ways because of what it was becoming. In 1905, Korea was not what it is today. It was an incredibly impoverished corner of the world. And if the lack of economic opportunity and life prospect wasn't enough, it was in the process of being annexed by Japan. It had suffered a number of humiliating invasions and defeats over the years. And now, for all intents and purposes, Japanese colonial rule was here, and it was increasing. Now, when these thousand-odd Koreans arrived in Mexico after a 50-day sea journey, they quickly walked into a circumstance that was vastly different from what they'd been promised. They were all to work as farmhands and under conditions that were effectively slavery. No one was making any money, certainly not enough to return home. And of these thousand, no one did. But in 1921, a small proportion of this population head across to Cuba. They are fleeing the tough conditions in Mexico, but they are also seeking, once again, greater economic opportunity. And tragically, again, when they arrive, this economic opportunity, for all that it was, quickly fades away. And this is about the point that Joseph Jun's documentary picks up. He bases his story about the life of a single Cuban Korean, Hieronimo Lim. Hieronimo's father was one of those original Koreans that left the peninsula, came through Mexico, and eventually onward to Cuba. So he was born into a world where he shared these two identities. And as you will see, much of this documentary, much of our discussion today, is about the idea of Korean identity outside of Korea, of foreign diasporas. However, Hieronimo's story is much more complex than this. He goes to university in Cuba and shares a classroom with Fidel Castro. Later on, he fights in the revolution and serves for almost three decades in the new Cuban government that seizes power. And a significant number of these years, he is working hand in glove with Che Guevara. But also, once Hieronimo leaves government, once he retires, he devotes the rest of his life to documenting and securing and championing the Korean identity of those Koreans now living inside Cuba. This really is a rare look inside an oddly underreported aspect of Korean history and the question of identity and how it changes over time. We look at those historical events, the importance of them, the way in which these families in Cuba looked back at Japanese occupation, the Korean War, the division of the peninsula, but also how that Korean identity maintains today. What part of the language, the culture, the food, and even the recognition that they are Korean now, as always, this podcast is entirely funded by you, the listener. So if you do want it to continue, please consider donating the Patreon account or the PayPal link attached below. On that, and to talk us through his documentary, Hieronimo, this is Joseph Jun. Joseph Jun, welcome to the Korean Now podcast. Thank you. Thanks for having me. So, of course, today we'll be speaking about your documentary, soon to be finished, soon to be released, hopefully, as well. But before we get into that, and before we talk through Geronimo and the content of what you've, and what you've created here, I think we should just build up a little bit of the historical background, just to touch so people know where we're coming from. Because I have to admit, myself, I wasn't that well informed about this before I bumped into some of your research and some of your, your projects here. So, take us back. Take us back to 1905 and uh, um, J- Japanese occupied Korea and this strange moment where over a thousand Koreans find themselves on a boat heading across the ocean to Mexico. Certainly. Um, so I must confess, uh, I was not an expert. I had no knowledge of this part of history until uh, I went to Cuba exactly three years ago, actually. Um, and by sheer chance, by meeting someone of Korean descent, uh, I became interested in this topic and I, I started doing research. So, um, so 1905, uh, 113 years ago, um, 
Korea uh, was at a, a very shaky period. Um, needless to say, Japan had just defeated uh, China and Japan Sino War in 1895, I believe. And soon thereafter, in 1905, Japan also defeated uh, Russia to uh, basically have a control over the peninsula. And little by little, uh, Korea was technically not annexed by Japan at the time, but Korea had, uh, Japan had taken over the diplomatic power that Korea possessed at the time. Um, so little power was left with Korea. Um, but I must mention that uh, the Korean Mexican or Korean Cuban history is uh, intricately connected to that of the Korean American history. And I say that because uh, the Koreans started coming to Hawaii in the year 1903. Uh, and I'm talking about massive immigration. Uh, there are a few individuals uh, around 100 people that came to the United States individually. And some of those figures are historic figures like Dosan An chang or Philip sajep um, who later contributes to the Korean independence movement. Um, but the massive immigration started in 1903 uh, to Hawaii. Obviously, Hawaii at the time, they were looking for cheap laborers um, to work in the sugarcane uh, plantations. And I don't know if I'll have a chance later, but um, one of the Korean-American journalists slash historians actually attributed to Koreans coming to Hawaii as a result of uh, the uh, Emancipation Proclamation by Abraham Lincoln. And some of you might be wondering, what's the connection there? Um, the Korean-American journalist K.W. Lee argues that once all the African slaves uh, were freed in America, uh, the people who are um, still in need of uh, these cheap laborers, they start looking into Asia to import, so-called import uh, these laborers. So they first imported, I'm using the word import um, because that's how they were treated, basically like objects. Uh, they first imported the Chinese immigrants, then Japanese, and then Koreans. So it's interesting that we can actually... Um, find the origin of uh, Koreans moving to Hawaii to the Emancipation Proclamation. But that's just an interesting side note, I'll, I must admit. Uh, so Koreans came to Hawaii, and uh, for two years there was a massive immigration. I think there are 72 occasions where the ship left from Incheon to transport these laborers to Hawaii. Interestingly enough, 1905, uh, there was a huge demand of labor in the Hennigan industry in Yucatan, Mexico. Hennigan, of course, is like cactus. Um, you can make ropes out of it. Um, and uh, so there's a plantation association in Yucatan that hired a broker, English broker by the name of John Meyer, who basically turned to Korea and said, hey, maybe I can get some laborers there because Korea is powerless, is technical, technically under Japanese control. So he flies to Korea or he you know, takes a ship to Korea and he uh, announces advertisement, uh, advertisements all over the newspapers, uh, which basically describe Mexico as heaven and earth. So about 1,000 Koreans um, mistakenly uh, took the word to be true, and they signed up uh, to go to Mexico. Um, and admittedly, some of them actually mistakenly believed that they were going to Hawaii because the way in which the advertisements were used, uh, it says, it describes Mexico as one of the states in, in the United States, right? Mm. Um, so a lot of them... Uh, actually mistakenly believed that they were going to Hawaii. Uh, little did they know, uh, once they traveled across the Pacific 40, for 45 days, uh, they landed in um, Salina Cruz, and they took a train, they took another boat, they ultimately landed in Yucatan. Um, and they were sold off to uh, 22 different plantations, uh, Hennigan plantations, and uh, that's the start of 
the Korean Mexican history, migration and to, history. Yeah. And to just build that out a touch more, um, what social backgrounds did these people come from? Because we can, as you mentioned there, there's the Japanese occupation, which is an element here. There's a, mm -hmm. a, they live in a country that, that, is, that is occupied. So is this a, uh, a situation where poor people uh, live in desperate conditions or is this a broader social class of people is in the sense that Korean society is, uh, I guess, um, struggling from top to bottom? Uh, I would argue, and I mean, from the research that I've done, um, there are elements of uh, many different social classes in that horde of a uh, thousand people. Um, some, the, the largest uh, consisting uh, group, it is told that um, were retired soldiers um, who were uh, either laid off or, or stopped working for the, the Korean Empire at the time, Joseon Empire. Um, so I think the number of the retired soldiers consists of anywhere between two to 300 people and their uh, relating family members. Um, but there were also uh, orphans, there were also homeless people who were just simply seeking a better life overseas. Um, and also there are some, um, even a priest and mudang who's like a shamanist. Uh, there were also some failing royal class members who saw no future, no hope in the chosen empire. Um, but the interesting thing is this, that uh, most of them thought they were coming back to Korea. Uh, the deal wasn't a permanent labor. Uh, it was for four years. It was a four-year contractual deal, right? So um, I would say every, almost everyone uh, believed that they will ultimately return to their homeland uh, after working in Mexico for four years. And that's an interesting point there because, as you mentioned, there's a certain degree of deception here. These, of course, these people leaving Korea are expecting something that they're not going to get. And uh, from looking through a lot of the work you've done here, when they arrive in Mexico, they are effectively pushed into uh, indentured servitude. They're effectively slaves in many ways. And you mentioned that many of them never leave. And uh, some of the reasons for this is because instead of making money, they are going deeper and deeper into debt because they can't live on what they earn there. So before we get to Cuba, of course, because this is where this is based, what is their life like when they get to Mexico? And uh, what are the conditions and what do they discover in this new land? Sure. Uh, uh, throughout the process of uh, interviewing various historians, uh, there seems to have been a, a debate around the term slavery. Uh, is it appropriate to call these Koreans indeed slaves, um, or is, is, you know, some other alternative words like indentured servitude or servants a more appropriate term? Uh, a lot of historians seems to agree that uh, slavery was actually a very accurate term to describe their labor conditions at the time. Um, of course, uh, it wasn't a permanent uh, servitude. It was for four years, but as you pointed out, uh, it was a perpetual debt uh, that was building up as where they were working. Um, the labor conditions were akin to uh, some of the, the the savory that's described in other documents uh, to describe either Mayan or you know African American slaves in America. Um, they weren't able to escape. Uh, they weren't able to uh, form a union or strike against the labor, uh, the employer, uh, in which the case this was a landlord of the hacienda. Um, so, and there they had no basic rights, right? Everything they had to, every food or items that they need uh, for a basic uh, livelihood had to be purchased within the farm. Um, and of course that would accumulate more debt, right? Um, so as you said, yes, uh, it was very similar to the slavery system. The only difference being that this was a four-year deal. Although uh, it, it needs to be pointed out that a lot of people also did, uh, did not uh, pay off their debt by the four-year term. So some people remained for much prolonged time. Um, yeah. And uh, there's this strange moment, and you touched on it earlier, that this for all the tragedy of this, there is a greater insult in 1910 when Japan formally annexes Korea. Um, 
these Koreans now living in Mexico uh, either have to go and register their, their new nationality as Japanese at the Mexican embassy, at the Japanese embassy in Mexico, or effectively become stateless citizens. And from that point as well, and as we build forward here, there's a, yeah, through all this tragedy and all this hardship, it, it builds up to this moment in 1921 when I think about 300 or so Koreans um, migrate down to Cuba. So let's take us there because this is the heart of your documentary, this life in Cuba. So how do they find their way down to Cuba? Sure. Uh, so as you said, uh, 1909, they were technically freed. Um, a lot of people were able to get out of the farm by paying off their debt, um, while others remained in the farm to pay off the remainder of their debt. Um, but the truth of the matter is that they weren't uh, paid the promised wages uh, that they were guaranteed before going to Mexico. So none of them had enough uh, money, uh, wealth to uh, buy a ticket back to their homeland. So, I mean, uh, although there are cases of one or two families that have gone back to Korea, um, the vast majority, 99% uh, of them remained in Mexico. Um, their idea was to work for another couple of years, uh, earn enough money, and with, with that money, return to the homeland. But interestingly enough, uh, Korea was annexed by Japan the year after. So uh, they essentially became stateless. And um, also what's interesting that happened domestically in Mexico was that there's a Mexican revolution occurring at the same time. Uh, both the, the revolutionaries and the government force, uh, they didn't welcome this new Asian ethnic uh, migrants uh, from Korea. So Koreans were in a position where, on one hand, their country was taken over by Japan, and on the other hand, they were being persecuted as ethnic minorities while there's a revolution going on. So it's, it's a total mess for them. Um, so they started going from one farm to the other, uh, trying to uh, find a rather a temporary settlement, uh, earning money uh, day by day, and trying to basically survive. Um, before we get to Cuba, though, there are a couple really fascinating events that I really wanted to include in my film, but uh, just by the sheer nature and, and scale of these events, uh, I, I didn't think it would do justice to just mention them in passing. So I had to completely take, in, uh, take out these two very, very interesting uh, moments in Korean history. One is 1911. Um, there's two missionaries, two Korean American missionaries that came down to Mexico from Hawaii after they heard about these uh, unfortunate uh, fellow citizens uh, being sold into slavery. These two Korean American missionaries, they came with the mission to rescue a thousand Koreans living in Mexico to Hawaii. And one Korean American journalist uh, coined the term the modern exodus. This could have been the modern exodus of Koreans leaving Mexico and coming to Hawaii on foot and later by a boat, whatever. So the, the plan was actually being executed. Uh, Koreans in Hawaii, they raised funds. Uh, they got an approval from the mayor or the government, uh, governor of Hawaii at the time to import these new set of uh, Korean uh, laborers into their hacienda or plantation, sugarcane plantations. Um, and Koreans in Mexico, they were actually, there are documents that indicate that they were very excited uh, to move to a new land to um, start their new chapter in their history, their personal history. What happens is um, the few delegates, the Korean Mexican delegates that were on their way to Hawaii, sort of as a pre-visit, uh, were caught at the, uh, the San Francisco border. And there were, uh, they committed some illegal activities, uh, the nature of which isn't so clear. And they were deported. So the Korean Mexican delegates were deported back to Mexico. Um, so all this plan that has been uh, being, being deliberated for years uh, just evaporated. Um, so the, the plan came to an end, and Koreans ended up you know, staying in Mexico as a result. 
Um, so well, just on that for a second, I hadn't heard this sure. story, of course, before. Um, it's a fascinating little thought there. Um, I have to assume, though, that the most of the Koreans they were going to bring to Hawaii uh, because these are missionaries were actually non-Christians, though, I have to assume, just based on the time period. Mm-hmm. Certainly, yes. Uh, uh, although uh, it's interesting you mentioned that because you're right, at the t- turn of the 20th century, uh, we can question, you know, what was really the, the percent of the population at the time. But uh, I, there are records that indicate that there was a very strong church activities in, in Mexico. Um, and we can only uh, guess as to why that is that is the case. Uh, one explanation can be that Mexico is a Catholic country. I mean, it was being dominated by the Spaniards at the time. Um, so perhaps... Uh, there were churches uh, located within each plantation farms that they were working in, or uh, there were also pastors, some of the priests that came with the group uh, as a labor, and they must they might have exerted some influence uh, on these Koreans. So it can be the either case or both. And uh, your uh, your second point that you weren't that you weren't able to squeeze into your documentary. Sure. Uh, was uh, 1916, um, I believe, uh, there was a revolution occurring in uh, Guatemala, which is close to Mexico. Uh, some of the revolutionaries in the jungles of Guatemala heard about, hey, they're over the border, there, there are these Koreans, uh, many of which were retired soldiers fighting in Korea. What if we import them? What if we recruit them as uh, part of our, our revolution against the, uh, our dictator in Guatemala? And so these uh, Guatemalan revolutionaries, they cross the border, they go find Koreans, and they end up succeeding recruiting over 30 to 40 Korean, uh, Koreans living in Mexico at the time. And they made a deal. The deal was this that if you come and help us topple our dictator in Guatemala, we'll give you both money for you to use to support the Korean independence movement against Japanese, and we'll also give you a piece of land in Guatemala, which you can use as a base to conduct these independence activities. So Koreans signed up for that that deal. Uh, And now it's a legend, and... This is more fictional, although some historians do argue that uh, this event actually really did take place. The 30 to 40 uh, Koreans living in Mexico that came to Guatemala actually named this new land in the jungles of Guatemala, the new Chosan, Shin Chosan in Korean. Um, uh, And, uh, you know, the accuracy and... um, the historical accuracy of this event uh, can only be guessed as to whether it was true, but I think it, it has a lot of symbolic value because it precedes the Shanghai Provisional Government, which was formed in 1919. Um, so it's one piece of history that I, I did want to include in my film, but I couldn't um, due to timing issue. And of course, that, that's a great piece of, uh, as you mentioned, linkage there, because a lot of these Koreans abroad um, are heavily involved in these independence activities, as you mentioned, the the, um, the um, Shanghai Pro- Provisional Government. But also later on, when we move into Cuba, of course, revolution is, of course, one of the things that comes to the fore quite quickly. So, mm-hmm. yeah, I'm really glad you brought those two things up. I was unaware of both of them. Um, let's walk us forward to Cuba then. So uh, how did these uh, these groups move forward? And we can... We can step away closer and closer to your uh, protagonist in your documentary. Certainly. So uh, let's keep in mind that so Koreans were scattered by this by this point. They were scattered all across uh, southern Mexico, uh, moving from one farm to the other, looking for a better livelihood, basically. Um, and their massive migration plan to Hawaii fails. Uh, there was a rather controversial recruitment of uh, 30 to 40 Korean soldiers into the Guatemalan revolution. Most of them died, by the way. Only a few managed to survive and and come back. 
so it was a, a chaotic moment to say the least. Um, and there was a World War I um, that takes place. And as a result, um, there was a worldwide demand of sugar. And uh, Cuba is quite well, you know, it still is quite well known for its sugar plantation. And there was a massive demand for uh, new laborers. So in 1921, um, the sugar price was at its highest in, in recent memory. Um, so uh, the rumor goes around within the Korean community. Uh, if you go to, if you cross this uh, Caribbean uh, sea, and reach a land called Cuba, there is a ample opportunities for people like us. So 288 Koreans uh, sign up and they cross the sea to arrive in a East Cuban uh, port city called Manati, where there was a, uh, a huge sugar, sugar cane plantations. Um, but there was another uh, unfortunate incident where the sugar cane price uh, drops uh, one-tenth of its price uh, just six months prior. So for instance, uh, if one gram of sugar, I'm just making this number up, was 20 cents per one gram, uh, by the time Koreans come, come to Manati, the, the price drops to two, two, uh, two cents instead of 20 cents. So uh, soon thereafter, Koreans arrived in, in Manati. Uh, they were all laid off. They couldn't find any job in the plantations, in the sugarcane plantations. So the only thing that they've learned how to do, what to do in the past 20 years was working at the Hennequin fields. Uh, in Cuba, there is a region called Matanzas, uh, which is dominated by the Hennequin fields at the time. So uh, Koreans hear about Matanzas. So uh, being familiar uh, with the know-how and the working conditions of Hennequin Fields, uh, massive, um, almost all of Koreans uh, leave Manati and they arrive in uh, Matanzas Field. And that's the start. That's essentially the start of the Korean uh, Cuban history. So that's probably also a good moment to introduce uh, your personal relationship with this store because as we step further and further here, we're going to be dealing with uh, Geronimo Lin, the central character of your documentary, and his father before him. So with that history in the bank there, let's wind ourselves many years forward, of course, to 2015. And uh, your first interaction with Cuba and uh, how you came to this project. And uh, after we get that, we'll build up a bit more of this uh, modern history and uh, the details of, your, um, of Geronimo Lin. Yes, certainly. So, um, so I'll tell about the, the serendipitous nature of my encounter with a Korean descendant and perhaps a non-serendipitous nature of my conviction, conviction to start this project. Uh, first, with the serendipity. Um, so three years ago, it just happens that it's exactly three years ago, um, I was working as an attorney in New York. Uh, I was working at a Korean government agency as an in-house counsel. Um, I was, I think at the time, three years into practice, so I was relatively a novice attorney. Um, I wanted to go to Cuba because it was uh, shortly after President Obama announced a move to normalize relations with Cuba. So uh, I wanted to go there before capitalism and Starbucks and McDonald's uh, took over the entire island. Um, so I went by myself uh, going via Canada because there was no direct flight at the time. And I, because it was a rather spontaneous thought and plan, uh, I had to email multiple hostels and see if any of them are available. Only one replied back and said, hey, we have a room, you can come. And me not speaking Spanish or never having been to any of the Caribbean nations, I requested a driver. Could you send me a driver who can pick me up from the airport? And they said, yes, we'll have a driver who will, you know, hold up a sign with your name on. So I'm like, cool. So I arrive at Havana, Jose Marti Airport, and I walk out of the gate. Uh, 
soon thereafter, I find a, a sign with my name on, and I look up, and it's a uh, it's a middle aged Asian lady, which is quite funny because first Cuban I met was a uh, this Asian lady. So I said, "Huh, quite interesting." And as we hop onto the car, I asked her, uh, "Would you happen to be Chinese?" Because uh, I'm relatively familiar with Chinese migrants that came to the Americas at the turn of the century. And she says, no, I'm fourth generation Korean Cuban. Um, and from there on, uh, my endless curiosity about how she came, her family history led to her inviting me to her household to meet with other family members and me spending an entire day with them traveling to different beach town, meeting more relatives there. And quickly, the, the nature of my trip completely changed and a few years in swing that trip uh if i were to talk about the non-serendipitous uh conviction that led me to start this project is that i've always been interested in uh this korean identity korean diaspora issue um i was born in minneapolis but i grew up in korea i came to the united states uh, at relatively later age um, at 18 um so like all immigrants or second-generation Korean-American friends, I, too, went through the sense of, I guess, identity crisis, um, having to choose one between these two dual identities. Uh, then I became interested in how Korean-American, modern Korean-American history has been formed. I, le I learned about the LA riots in 1992, how uh, Korean you know, migrants and Korean-American community at the time was just really victimized and persecuted. Um, but LA rights was still viewed as a, a fight between the black and white, so to speak. And upon learning that incident, I, I came to realize what it means to be Korean-American. And funny enough, my first job outside of uh, college was I went to Yunbyon, China. And... Uh, which shares this border with North Korea, it's northeast part of China, where it has over 2 million Korean ethnic Chinese students or Chinese people. I worked at a college called UST, uh, Yunbyon University of Science and Technology, as a videographer and a media personnel. But there I ran into Korean ethnic Chinese students who also had, although different, different in nature, also had a sense of dual identity crisis, um, not knowing you know, how to identify themselves, whether as Chinese or Korean. And I thought this was very interesting because I knew I realized I wasn't the only one, or Korean Americans weren't the only one dealing with the dual identities. Uh, then in law school, I had an opportunity to intern in Brazil. There I got plugged into the 50,000 Korean Brazilian community. And they also had a sense of dual identity crisis. When I was backpacking through Germany, I ran into Korean Germans. When I was interning in Africa, I ran into Korean Africans. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, quite recently, even in Russia, I ran into over 300,000, you know, I learned about the over 300,000 Korean Russians. Um, and then, you know, the idea of Korean diaspora began to form. Um, kind of like... Jewish people. I often use Jewish people as a, a comparable example. Uh, there is a sense of uh, unifying experience that Koreans in all different parts of the world share in common, and that is the Japanese uh, occupation, the Korean War, um, the, the division, and, and whatnot. Right? So I started getting really obsessed um, with this whole notion of Korean diaspora, not in a nationalistic sense, perhaps, but as a self-empowerment tool, rather. And uh, I, you know, there are some statistics. There are over 8 million Koreans living outside of Korea. And I'm only including the South Korean population, of course. So South Korea is about 50 million, but 8 million out of 50 million, that's 16% of Korean population living outside of Korea. And I just realized the other day that 8 million is a number that is more than the population of Busan, 
Taejeon and Daegu combine all together. So it's a really significant number. But the perception of Koreans living outside of Korea, for Koreans living in Korea, is not only foreign, but often very hostile, right? Um, if you're a Korean ethnic Chinese living in Korea or a Korean defector living in Korea or Korean Russian for that matter, they're generally regarded as a second class citizen, right? Not as worthy as the pure blooded uh, domestic Korean. For Koreans living in North America or Europe, they're perceived as the privileged Koreans. And of course, I'm generalizing, there are also significant pockets of population that embrace. Koreans living outside of Korea, but I'm talking about the general perception. So I realized that uh, there is a significant disconnect be between people of the homeland and people of the overseas. Um, so this is a background of my own conviction that I've always been interested in Korean diaspora issues. So when I met Patricia, the taxi driver in Cuba, I, I almost felt that this is a destined project for me, a lifetime project for that matter. Because uh, it's something that I've always been interested in. So that's my long answer to you. Yeah, no, it was quite interesting. Yeah. I really enjoyed it. Um, so from that, as you talk about these ideas of um, um, Korean diasporas and how they're treated abroad, let's move into that uh, Korean diaspora in Korea and, of course, through some of your main characters. So your, your documentary is based around a main character, but his father uh, came mm -hmm. across with that original boat from um, uh, Korea to Mexico and then down and then across to Cuba. Um, so he arrives in that circumstance, the father of our, our protagonist in this. He, he arrives in that circumstance, and uh, as you mentioned, he expects they are all expecting a very different reality of what they find. So how are they first treated? How are they first found? So despite the economic um, um, uh, deprivation that they walk into, how are they treated by the locals? Because I have to assume, though, there are, like you say, a, a significant number of um, uh, other ethnicities inside Cuba. This was mm -hmm. the first uh, real contact with Korea. Sure. Uh, uh, the... Prevailing policy uh, of Cuba at the time was to favor new immigrants from primarily from Europe. So it is indicated that uh, new migrants coming from China, uh, Japan, and Korea were uh, signif significantly disadvantaged as compared to uh, European migrants. Uh, I have to say there are at least 100 times uh, much more, many more Chinese migrants in Cuba. So they had a significant size on their own, whereas we're talking about less than 300 Korean migrants in Cuba. So the number was very insignificant. Um, there was a law that's passed in 1940 in Cuba, um, a law that stipulated uh, favoring local and Cuban ethnic uh, laborers over foreign laborers. So each um, workforce has to employ a vast majority of its, uh, its employees as a local domestic uh, countrymen rather than a foreign migrant. So Koreans, obviously, because there were, a lot of them are working in the Hennigan and other uh, manual jobs, they were disadvantage, not only disadvantage, but they were laid off. So there was both um, social stigma as well as legal discrimination that was at force. And maybe this is a good time to, to start talking about Heronimo because Heronimo was born in 1926 in Cuba. And by the way, I used to pronounce his name Geronimo. As so I'm, I'm person. pronouncing it wrong throughout this discussion. <laughs> no, you're not the only one. I was, uh, I've been pointed out multiple times by, by my Spanish friends. And then it took me, you know, months before I came to pronounce his name as Geronimo. <laughs> okay. um, so, yeah, he was born in 1926, uh, five years after uh, Koreans migrated to Cuba. His father, as you mentioned, was one of those uh, 1,033 Koreans that came to Mexico initially. So uh, he was newly wed by the time he came to Cuba. Obviously, he worked in the Hennigan field. 
uh, almost all his life until revolution. He even cut his uh, thumb, one of his fingers, um, as an accident, by an accident, as he was cutting one of the Hennequin leaves. So in a lot of photos that you see, there, one of his fingers is missing. Uh, so Heronimo was the first of nine children. And uh, as we'll find out later, he, one of the primary reasons that drove him to social issues and later to the revolution was to achieve equality and basic rights as any other Cuban citizen because of the poverty and discrimination he faced in childhood and youth. Um, so that was his primary driving force for participating in the revolution. And um, just before we get there, his father, I'm assuming this must have affected his life growing up a lot too, despite being one of those originally very poor Cuban, um, very poor Mexicans and Cubans that, that, um, that newly arrived, sent almost sent consistently a lot of money back to the provisional government in Shanghai. So this idea of a revolution um, was very much, I have to assume, was very much in his, uh, in his upbringing. Certainly. Uh, and this is what's interesting about me hopping onto a cab, uh, you know, and just being plugged in directly to the Lin family because uh, I must say, uh, without prejudice, that Lin family was quite special. They're quite exceptional in, in talking about the Korean Cuban history. It's because, precisely because of the presence of uh, Heronimo's father, his name is Im Chan Tek. Uh, as you pointed out, he uh, initiated collecting funds among uh, the Korean migrants living in Cuba at the time to uh, send those funds to the Shanghai Provisional Government to support Korea's independence movement. Um, so not only that, he was, uh, he was a teacher and a principal of Korean language school for many years, both in Matanzas and Cardenas, a neighboring town. Um, and yeah, he was... Uh, uh, very passionate uh, about cultivating the sense of Korean identity and instilling in not only his children but other future generations a sense of uh, the love and desire for the homeland. Um, so fast forward, you know, 80 years later, after he passed away, um, Korean government recognizes Kim Chun Tech's efforts to uh, support Korea's independence and also cultivating this uh, Korean identity within the Cuban community. Um, and he, they, the Korean government designates him as one of the patriots. He received the highest medal that a civilian uh, can receive. And so his ashes, which was buried in Cuba uh, in nine, until 2001, was moved to was transported to a national cemetery in Korea. So now he lays in the, in the cemetery, the national cemetery of Korea. So let's begin to build up his son, Heronimo. Sure. Um, so I have, I, I, I have to assume there's a lot of detail here that I'm going to have to brush over a little bit in his early life. But sure. one of the things that, that really does jump out an awful lot there is, is this remarkable, I suppose, chance encounter in many ways that he studies law in 1946. And of course, I'm, I have to assume that this, this is a... Um, a great opportunity inside Cuba in many ways that he can actually go to university as the second generation. But he mm -hmm. studies he studies law, and uh, one of his classmates turns out to be Fidel Castro. Yes. Uh, so Heronimo was actually the first uh, Korean to enroll in university. Uh, so he makes many many of the firsts uh, in the Korean Cuban history in general. But yes, he was the first one to enroll in university. Uh, he gets admitted to the best university in the, the entire Caribbean at the time, which is Havana University, and he studies law. Uh, the same year he enrolled, uh, one of his classmates, as he pointed out, was Fidel Castro. And, you know, me being an observer and a filmmaker for this project, uh, I, I was obsessed <laughs> with this notion of Heronimo having gone to the same school. Fidel, what was their relationship? What was their intimacy? You know, to which extent did they communicate throughout revolution and post-revolution? 
Um, I don't want to spoil too much. <laughs> yes, don't, don't. <laughs> for, for the movie. Uh, although I would say that the um, uh, their relationship and their intimacy isn't as intimate as I I would hope that it would have been. But they certainly knew of each other. Um, I mean, everyone knows Fidel, that's for sure. But there are incidents where Heronimo's wife shares where Fidel and Heronimo uh, uh, cross his paths. And there are some uh, small incidents where they sh- shared some you know, jokes together. Uh, at some point, uh, after many years passed by, uh, Fidel mistakenly took Heronimo as a foreign technician <laughs> uh, <laughs> when they came across in the elevator. And... Uh, you know, the minister who was standing by Heronimo at the time uh, quickly corrected Fidel by saying, no, he's one of our own. He's a vice minister of our government. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I mean, just by, because Heronimo was the only Korean working in the Castro government uh, for over two, two decades, right? Um, although there are arguably some other Chinese ethnic uh, Cubans working at the government, Heronimo was um, uh, his own. He's the only Korean one, yeah. And uh, as you said, don't give too much away here. And, and, and I know the, 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 the details must be pressing a lot, but um, uh, he does move forward. So he, he goes to university in some ways. He has some maybe brief interactions with, Fed, with Fidel Castro. But I suppose the important point in this is that only a few years later, he joins the revolution. He is one of those early guerrillas that fights and um, uh, achieves the communist revolution inside Cuba. Certainly. So, well, when we typically uh, think of the Cuban revolution, uh, the popular media image is uh, these you know, guerrillas or uh, fighters, right, in the mountains in Sierra Maestra. Uh, Fidel, you know, with his a uh, green uniform, uh, you know, smoking cigar with Che and whatnot. Uh, another significantly important group that's o- often overlooked, perhaps is because it's not as sexy as those uh, guerrilla fighters in the mountains, is the the secretive uh, clandestine group uh, fighting in the city. So they carry out a lot of covert actions. Uh, not a perhaps not a direct, you know firing guns and, you know, uh, clashing with the, the government forces, but there are the intels, right? They are the fundraisers. Uh, they are the, uh, uh, the only private channel of communication with the guerrilla fighters in the mountains, um, sending them money, sending them arms, and then sending them food and whatnot. Heronimo was actually one of the clandestine members, not fighting in the mountains. Um, and, uh, you know, I mean, this is a really interesting point because uh, we try to dig out as much information possible from those that were close to Heronimo, um, but we weren't able to attain much of the information just because of the secretive nature. Uh, even though the revolution triumphed and, you know, many years have passed, um, the information was either not shared openly or they were not allowed to disclose what he did. So even his wife uh, w- was able to give us very superficial information on what he did. But Heronimo um, did a lot of work within the clandestine movement. And for it, he achieved, he later received one of the highest medals in, in the Cuban government um, as having participated in the clandestine movement. And uh, before we move forward a little bit here, I have to assume that uh, some of the motivation for joining this revolution must have been that, that real push of equality, despite how long Koreans have clearly been inside Cuba. There must have been some discrimination. And I read some reports of there being uh, limits on, uh, at least some normative limits on, on foreign workers working in the fields while the factories were blocked off to local Cubans and things like this. So the, I'm assuming there's an element in this of emancipation and an element of uh, achieving equality. And I have to assume that after this happened, um, there the must it must have done, I suppose, wonders for that idea of multiculturalism and integration, simply the fact that you had people that many people in Cuba maybe thought of as foreign fighting their revolution with them side by side and winning next to them. Yeah, uh, 
It's a very interesting point because um, uh, Cuba already had uh, a certain level of multiculturalism just by virtue of Cuba being one of the first state that brought in the slaves, right? So in, in terms of the sheer ethnic culture, I think um, it was prevalent, both the white Spaniard culture and the African uh, culture coexisted at the time. Now the, the, the Korean population was, as I said, very insignificant at the moment. So they had close to no visibility. Um, so the, uh, I, I can understand Heronimo's desire to sort of make himself and his community more visible and uh, by participating in these important national movements, uh, he most, most likely have believed that he could achieve basic rights and equality because the whole premise of the Castro's revolution in the beginning was to, you know, topple the corrupt dictatorship of Batista and thereby, you know, building a more democratic, um, equal society for all. Uh, what's interesting, though, is that there's a turn of events, right? Um, as I was making this film, I looked into multiple uh, old clips uh, where Fidel affirms over and over that uh, he has no interest in communism, that he's actually fighting for democratic ideals and social justice. Um, and I have to presume that the ideology didn't really matter for most of the people participating in the revolution, at least in its first years. Uh, things become much more interesting and unfortunate when the government takes a communist turn and people uh, start to wonder whether, you know, if this is something that they believed in in the beginning. And Heronimo, there are ample evidence to to show that Heronimo was also one of those um, individuals where, uh, you know, the, the unfulfilled promises of communism has really uh, made him struggle and agonize. And uh, as you mentioned there, the communist element at least came in strength a little bit later. And when it does come into strength, um, if Heronimo didn't have a a strong relationship with Fidel Castro, he must have had a much closer relationship with Che Guevara uh, insofar as he joins this organization, he joins the revolution, and he serves uh, most of his life, most of his, his professional life after that as a high-ranking government official. And at one point, he's the director of the Department of Food and Industry, and mm -hmm. Che Guevara is the minister just above him. Absolutely. So, you know, I, I grew up reading Motorcycle Diaries, uh, I admire Che so much that at one point, uh, actually in between law school, I traveled across South America, try to follow the footsteps of Che Guevara. And so when I went to Cuba and uh, went into this family and I was told that at some point there was this Korean guy working side by side Che, I was totally blown away. <laughs> <laughs> um, it, you know, I mean, just... It's a, it's a, it's a really flattering thought that you know the Che Guevara, the iconic hero uh, of the revolution. There was a Korean guy working with him. It's, it was just you know unthinkable. But anyway, yes, uh, um, Che was the minister of the Ministry of Industries, uh, and within that Ministry of Industries, there are many different divisions. Uh, Heronimo was the director of one of the divisions of foodstuffs, um, which was basically in charge of distributing food, uh, planning the yearly uh, crop and, uh, you know, the harvest and, and things of that nature. So he was essentially a uh, number two guy. He was right below minister of the ministry of foodstuffs. So there are moments, yes, where Heronimo and, and Che also cross his paths. And there are some anecdotes, interesting anecdotes of them also sharing some jokes, some um, recollection of Che's impressions, um, Che's humor, Che's uh, 
personality and, and things of that nature. And it, will, it can be seen in the movie. Yeah. So I, I am conscious here not to give away too much of the actual not documentary coming in itself. So uh, let's move on to a couple of broader questions, actually, and um, just some broader ideas that kept sort of pinging in my ears as we're walking through this. So you talk a lot about the idea of Korean identity outside of Korea and Korean diasporas. Um, I have to assume that uh, um, for uh, Hieronimo's father, this was a, 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 a challenging issue of sorts, even for Hieronimo himself. But when you were in Korea, when you were in Cuba, you must have encountered a community. I assume that was quite well um, integrated. I mean, effectively Cuban in many ways. So let's talk about some of the Korean identity that exists inside uh uh, Cuba and how that may have changed over 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 the years. So, how do modern Cuban Koreans see their identity these days, and uh, are they visibly, noticeably, noticeably Korean? Because, at least from my understanding, the the language in many ways has disappeared. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, so, one of the blessings and curses of the Cuban Revolution was that yes, the revolution did achieve equality. Yes, the revolution did bring a sense of unity and basic rights to the Korean uh, immigrants in Cuba. Uh, the flip side of that is that it created one large Cuban communist identity. And what happened as a result is that it uh, discarded, um, it uh, made everyone renounce their own ethnic cultural identity as a result. So by that I mean there is no more Korean identity. There is no more Korean language schools. There is no more Korean churches. Uh, there is no more Korean community, right? So they basically traded their equality and rights with their identity. So there is no record and documents of Korean activities through the 60s, 70s, 80s, and all the way to the 90s. Uh, the reason I found Heronimo's character to be fascinating and very important in talking about the larger Korean diaspora is because, <laughs> again, without giving too much, he's, he's the one who single-handedly uh, initiated the revival and reconstruction of Korean identity in Cuba. Um, and his heroic activity is uh, displayed in, in my film through the voices of a lot of Korean missionaries that work with him. The identity issue, you're right. I mean, there's just so many anecdotes and stories that I want to share. But most importantly, because Im Chan Tech, Heronimo's father, was always interested in this, um, uh, you know, honoring their homeland and heritage and cultural background. Uh, the only embassy, the only Korean embassy that exists in Cuba up until now is, is North Korean embassy. Uh, South Korea doesn't have diplomatic relations with, I think, three to three to three or four countries in the world now. Cuba happens to be one of them. The other two is North Korea and Syria. Um, and so, yeah, North Korean embassy has been present in, in Havana since 1960. So there are many anecdotes of uh, anecdotes of Heronimo's father, Im Chan Tech, traveling all the way from Matanzas to Havana by his own means to knock on the door of Korean embassy and receiving any materials that he can get that's written in Korean for him to distribute to other Koreans living in Matanzas and also teaching uh, his kids with those materials. And what's funny is um, now I go interview uh, the either the children or the grandchildren of Im Chan Tech and they recollect uh, studying, you know, this idea of chuche. <laughs> <laughs> um, although they might not necessarily uh, understand uh, its deeper implication, they know that it's propaganda for sure, but, and they might not necessarily agree with anything that it says, but that was the only source for them to uh, stay connected to their homeland. Um, so, uh, yeah, that was the only extent to which they were exposed to their uh, Korean identity was through North Korean embassy. Well, uh, let's linger that on that for just a moment here, because yeah. I suppose something that we have brushed over here, it, uh, it, it must have been this traumatic moment, of course, in 1945 for these Koreans. 
abroad who have been, as you said, his father fighting so hard for independence, suddenly get independence, and then there is division. So there must have been a, a, a challenge here. And of course, when you talk about Korean identity, it, it automatically suddenly becomes a split identity with North Korea and South Korea. And uh, because this is, um, as you say, a communist revolution inside Cuba, they mm -hmm. quickly develop uh, strong relationships with North Korea. And people like Che Guevara travel to North Korea and, and speak mm -hmm. highly of Kim Il Sung. Mm -hmm. But of course, um, when the Soviet Union crashes in 19, in uh, 1989 and 1990, this begins to shift. And of course, Cuba these days, as you mentioned, one of the reasons you're trying to go down there so quickly was because you want to get in before it becomes too capitalistic and changes too much from its old ideas. So there must be a shift in identity inside the country about uh, this relationship back with Korea and uh, which Korea they are related to. Yeah, yeah, that's a very important point. Uh, I must say that, you know, I think I interviewed probably over about 60 to 70 descendants, historians and others. Um, no one openly admitted that they had closer allegiance to North Korea in the beginning. Um, although I must suspect that must have been the case. Um, although there are some letters from Im chan Tak that he sent to Korea um, right before the Communist Revolution where uh, he, he, there, there are records of him saying that I fear Cuba is being taken over by communism and I'm not a communist. He clearly states those words. Um, but once the revolution does take place um, and the supposed equality is brought upon people, and when North Korea opens its embassy in, in Cuba, only a year after the revolution, yes, I must suspect that uh, many Korean Cubans um, sided with North Korea. And, you know, we got to bear in mind that the North Korean economy was much better than that of South until the 70s, right? But you're right. Uh, um, when the Soviet Union... Uh, this integrates into, you know, many different uh, nations, including Russia. And when Cuba experiences what's called a special period, which is akin to North Korea's, you know, arduous march or the march of suffering, uh, with no more support coming in from the Soviet Union, you know, they go through a severe poverty right, throughout the country for almost a decade. And with the end of communism, you're right, the, the sense of, I think, their allegiance to the communist ideals and different nations also come to an end. And there, there is a shift that does take place. So, you know, answering, going back to your question of how do Koreans in Cuba identify themselves, uh, there is a two-part answer to this. One is that which I think one is more profound than the other. I'll first share the less profound idea, is that they claim that North Korean embassy, despite its establishment and presence in Havana for close to 60-some years, they never supported the Korean immigrants in Cuba. Uh, the, the ones that did support them were South Korean missionaries and volunteers and tourists that came to Cuba, right? Uh, they recognize the, the, the I, I, I'm trying to be careful with the word I use to describe North Korea because of the improved uh, nature of its relations. But they recognize the, uh, I guess, the funny nature of North Korea's dictatorship over generation. And they recognize the prosperity and the advancement of democratic ideals of South Korea. And they're not brainwashed. They, the way they perceive the peninsula is very clear and up-to-date and modern, I would say. So, and, you know, I, I cannot forget to mention the, the influence of K-pop and K-drama that's sweeping over Cuba. So, uh, you know, the funny, funny joke, running joke is that second most popular person in Cuba is Imin Ho, who's a 
very well-known Korean celebrity after Fidel. Um, and the best phones that they carry is Samsung Galaxy. The best car that they drive is Kia or Hyundai. So there's a very heightened sense of you know, what it means to be part of the South Korean uh, influence instead of North Korea. But the, the second part of the answer, uh, which I think is more profound, is that some of the, the older and more mature Cubans, when we, Korean Cubans, when we interviewed them, they said, when the question was, you know, how do, how do you identify yourself? As, or do you feel closer to North Korea or South Korea? And they say, when, when our grandparents or when our great-grandparents came from Korea, Korea was just one country. And that's how we regard ourselves as one Korean, not from the North or the South. Right? Um, and my, my film, I, I tried to not make it ideological or political, but to really preserve that essence of them having come from one country and yet now that's divided. And now as a result of many world political events happening around them, uh, they are end up with these torn identity uh, and trying to really find themselves uh, away from their homeland. Well, that puts a, a quite a neat bow on things. So I suppose uh, we should uh, almost get ready to leave things here. But I, I should get you to, to just to pitch to the audience a little bit about your documentary, uh, when people can expect it, what phase it is in, just so people can keep their eyes out for it. Uh, sure. Uh, you know, in all honesty, uh, I had never imagined that this project will uh, take this many years as I had hoped, because uh, in the beginning, my, my hope was very humble. I thought at most I'll create a 30-minute video and upload on YouTube for people to watch. Um, but as I noticed, more funding com coming in, more interest being expressed, and just the sheer magnitude and depth of this part of history, I, I realized that it needs to be better made. Um, so I, I started stepping up my game and trying to work with best people that, that I know around me. And so it's been three years already, and um, uh, I, I had never imagined. I thought it would be done at the latest by last year around this time. But now I'm, I can finally say it's almost done. Um, hopefully within two, one or two months, I'll have a complete product. And at this moment, I'm submitting it to various different film festivals. So the first premiere would take place in whichever festival that decides to accept this film. Um, and if Korea, any of the Korean broadcasting network is interested in showing maybe a TV version, uh, that is something that I'm certainly open to and interested in exploring. Um, and I'm also sub uh, submitting my film to uh, film festivals in Korea so that I have a chance to watch and uh, distribution is, is, is a tricky thing, but I'm hoping to have as much exposure as possible. Um, and of course, the quality of film has to match uh, the hype that I created around it. So I'm working hard to finish the creative side of it. And the uh, title of the film is uh, Heronimo. Heronimo, yes. Okay, it's, uh, great. both literal and uh, I think there's a lot of symbolic meaning behind his name. So, yep. Great. So uh, I'll definitely keep my eyes out and I encourage the listeners to do the same. Uh, so on that, I suppose we should leave it there. Joseph Chun, thanks for coming on the Career Now podcast. Oh, thank you so much, Jen. I enjoyed it.